Uh, unfortunately, uh, Behruz Qamari Tabrizi is uh, not feeling, is under the weather today, so he can't be here. And so I have the privilege of introducing our esteemed guest, Gonar Nikpur. Uh, Gonar is, in addition to being a, uh, uh, a highly, uh, uh, a, I don't know what to say. She's an amazing scholar, and she's also an amazing, one of my very good friends. And so uh, it is an honor to introduce her. She is a scholar of modern Iranian political and intellectual history with a particular interest in the history of law, incarceration, revolution, and rights. She holds a PhD from Columbia and uh, Columbia's Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies, and teaches on an interdisciplinary set of topics, including modern Middle Eastern uh, and North African history, Iranian history, political theory, Islamic studies, critical prison, prison studies, colonialism and decolonization, and women and gender studies. So she is an extremely versatile thinker, and that versatility will you'll see come through in her uh, presentation on her newly published book. Uh, Golnar is a professor of history at Dartmouth University and has published in Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, uh, Humanity, International Journal of Middle East Studies, the Can Canadian Journal of History, the New York Times, Jadalia, and Tehran Bureau. Um, and uh, she, yeah, she has a lot of qualifications and I can spend the entirety of this session listing them off, so I'll stop there. And I will now uh, give the dais to her to present her uh, book. So with that being said. That's okay, I'm gonna... Okay. Hi, everybody. Can everyone hear me? I have a slightly different microphone. So if, if anyone can't hear me, just let me know. Um, oh, wait. I think now it should be on. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Navid, for that generous introduction. Um, thank you all for being here today. And thank you in particular to the Sharmin and Bijan Musavar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies and to our absent host, uh, Dr. Behruz Qamari Tabrizi, who unfortunately, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Mansouri mentioned, is sick today, uh, but who uh, I'm so grateful for having invited me here to share my new book with you. Uh, a sincere thank you also to Alison Cummins for help in organizing my visit. Now, as Navid mentioned, my talk today is drawn from my just published book, which is titled The Incarcerated Modern, Prisons and, uh, Prisons and Public Life in Iran uh, on Stanford University Press. The book charts the history of Iran as a modern carceral state, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means uh, throughout the talk. Um, so I'll, I'm going to give an overview of the themes, arguments, and archive of the book um, over the next uh, a little while, um, and if, if, you know, obviously there's a lot that I can't get to uh, an entire book in a short talk, so if anyone has questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them in the Q&A afterwards. So let me just jump right in. Prisons in Iran today have an unhappy global reputation. Even those with only cursory knowledge of contemporary Iranian politics have likely heard accounts of arbitrary arrest, torture, and executions in today's Islamic Republic. Uh, for their part, global human rights organizations, uh, alongside Iranian dissidents and expatriates, have worked to publicize the prison violence and torture uh, that it's endemic to the Iranian uh, system. Uh, they've published memoirs, produced scholarship, engaged in letter writing campaigns, and founded innumerable organizations in defense of incarcerated Iranians. Now, unsurprisingly, a network of sometimes strange political bedfellows across the political spectrum around the world have also focused on Iran's prisons to name and shame uh, the Islamic Republic government, uh, to push for the release of detained Iranians, and in many cases to advocate against the existence of the Islamic Republic altogether. Now given this well-known and blood-soaked reputation, it may surprise some people in the room uh, to learn that the Islamic Republic of Iran, that is uh, the government of Iran after the 1979 revolution, has also from its inception used Iran's prisons as proof of its moral and political legitimacy. 
But naturally, the story that Iran, the contemporary government tells about its prisons uh, are qu is qu quite a different story than the one told by its myriad critics. For the Islamic Republic, that same 1979 revolution represented an unequivocal break with the violence and uh, sort of structures of the Pahlavi monarchy led at the time by uh, the second Pahlavi king, Mohammad Reza Shah, and an unequivocal break with the violence and torture endemic to the former Shah's prisons. This is such an important story for legitimization for the current government that the current government, that the reminding Iranians of Iran's pre-revolutionary prisons and the torture endemic to those prisons is something of a cottage industry for the post-Iranian state, just as downplaying the Islamic Republic's own prison violence is those same pr officials' modus operandi. There are major state-sponsored research institutes and initiatives that publish regularly on the to topic of torture in Pahlavi Iran. Members of the Islamic Republic who elite who spent time in the prisons of the monarchy, and there are many of them um, still, up to and including leader Ali Khamenei, also continue to trade in tales of their pre-revolutionary detention and torture. This is such an important part of the story to the leadership of the Islamic Republic that if you even go to Khamenei's web personal website, uh, one of the main sort of like uh, parts that you can click on and look at is his narration of his experience in prison under the Shah. Now, in the most physically conspicuous example of this phenomenon, uh, the Islamic Republic has also turned some of the notorious prisons open during the pre-revolutionary era, uh, either under Reza Shah or Muhammad Reza Shah, into museums, repurposing those institutional spaces to affirm the government's official narrative of pre-revolutionary violence, revolutionary struggle, particularly among the clerics, and post-revolutionary freedom. So this is an image of one of those prisons turned into museums, Qast prison, which was throughout the 20th century, uh, maybe the most important prison in Iran. Uh, it's an institution to which I'll return in this talk in a little bit. Now it's a museum, its grounds are turned into public parks. So if you go there, you might just see people taking a stroll. It's in the middle of Tehran. Uh, and it's a green space that is, is technically open to, to whomever wants to visit. And this isn't the only one of these prison museums. This is something that has happened in a couple of different spaces. <clears throat> so we see that there's a struggle over Iran's carceral record, over its history, over how to look at it and how to understand, um, how to understand uh, its, its legacy. But despite this present day struggle, Iran's modern prison system has its origins in the late 19th century into the 20th century and has been shaped not only by the particularities of Iranian politics, uh, both under the Shah and in the Islamic Republic, but uh, by Iran's broader encounter with uh, global powers, uh, namely Europe and eventually the United States. It is this longer history of the modern carceral state in Iran with which my book is centrally concerned. Now let me stop here for a moment and talk just very briefly about what I mean by carceral, which is a word I'll use many, many times over the course of this talk. So obviously carceral comes from incarceration. The idea of carcerality though, following um, sort of longer tradition in prison studies from Foucault onwards, the idea of the carceral or the carceral continuum is that the, the carceral state, the institutions of carcerality of a modern state are not only its prisons, that's the sort of dense node of power that holds the, the sort of most focus for those of us in prison studies. But carcerality is, is something that kind of extends across several different institutions of the modern state, policing, surveillance, uh, the legal system, prisons, et cetera. So when I say the carceral state, it's all of those things. It's the idea that a modern state will have all of these kind of institutions embedded in it that um, are the institutions of surveillance, policing, and punishment. In the book, I chart Iran's transformation from a decentralized empire with few people in forced confinement in the late 19th century into a modern nation state with a vast prison network today. Indeed, the number of prisoners across Iran has steadily increased in the past century, culminating in an era in which, according to uh, the Islamic Republic's Organization of Prisons and National Security Measures, um, in numbers that are actually surely an undercount for reasons I can explain in the Q&A. There are now at least a quarter of a million prisoners in about 270 official prisons. Now in charting this big change, uh, the book asks, 
How and why did this massive transformation happen, really o over only a century? How did Iranians come to understand their increasingly surveilled and punished so social worlds? How have subsequent Iranian governments touted the benefits of these prisons? What political movements have emerged in the context of prisons or were organized against carceral practices? What sorts of solidarities have these movements demanded? And finally, how do we understand the global networks in which these prisons were first built and have subsequently taken root? Now, before I go any further into the arguments of the book, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about the temporal range of what I cover um, and what the chapters are really looking at. So I, the temporal range of the book is such that I cover three distinct historical eras, the Qajar era, the Pahlavi era, and the contemporary Islamic Republic era. I really start in the, in the late Qajar period, not the earlier Qajar period. Um, but we see that, again, that trajectory that I'm talking about from decentralized, uh, in, sort of decentralized uh, imperial formation to uh, quite an entrenched modern nation state with a quarter of a million prisoners today. <clears throat> this chronology covers two revolutionary movements, the Constitutional Revolution of 1905 to 1911 and the Revolution of 1979, as well as two coups in 1921 and 1953. And it shows that the infrastructure of the modern carceral state has undergirded ideologically opposed governments, despite instances of transformative political change. The book has six chapters, and I, I won't go too much in detail about each one, but I wanted to show a little bit of what the the sort of overall trajectory of the book is here. Um, the book has six chapters, not counting an introduction and brief conclusion, and begins during the 1848 to 1896 reign of Nasir ad-Din Shah Qajar. In that early era, um, we start to see the roots of the modern prison system in Iran. When uh, the sort of nar narrative that I'm, I'm proposing there is we start to see an enormous number of European colonial officers uh, across Qajar Persia. And they're increasingly targeted for violence, quotidian violence, by, by locals, by local Iranians. This violence, in turn, um, adds to anxieties, both among European uh, colonial officers and company men and among uh, Iranian reformists, budding nationalists, uh, about apparent Qajar lawlessness. Now, these concerns lead to calls for increased policing, punishment, and legal reform, uh, leading to the first um, small modern prison network in Iran to be built in the 1910s. The book has three chapters on the Pahlavi period, which I consider really the sort of key, the key moment in entrenching the carceral state and making it sort of really embedding it into the, uh, letting its roots grow in, in the system of uh, the modern nation state in Iran. <clears throat> the Pahlavi era, of course, being 1925 to 1979. Um, it's the era in which modern legal and carceral systems are centralized and entrenched. Under Reza Shah, amid the changes wrought by legal centralization, Pahlavi officials participated in European prison and policing conferences. They planned dozens of new modern prisons. They built several of those prisons. Um, they also built set in numer um, numerous, I should say, uh, prison factories and prison uh, education facilities and came to start to champion these prisons as spaces of rehabilitation as opposed to simply punishment in which aberrant criminals could be transformed into productive citizens. Now the chapters I write on the Pahlavi era also include close examinations of two distinct political movements, the Iranian guerrilla movement of the 1970s and the global human rights movement of the 60s and 70s. Uh, into the 80s, both of which play key roles in popularizing the image of Shah as torturer globally and in the case of the human rights movement, also uh, contribute to the almost immediate sense of the Islamic Republic as similarly engaging in uh, acts of prison torture. Now the book, the last few chapters are on the post-79 period, uh, a period which again, like the Pahlavi era, uh, the carceral state has again expanded despite pre-revolutionary promises by Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, the leader of the revolution, uh, that in a, in a system of true Islamic justice, Khomeini said, no one, and this is a quote, would need to be imprisoned for even a single day. Now, the section on the post-79 period begins with an unlikely moment amid the triumph of the revolution, during which revolutionaries attempting to free prisoners from Evin prison 
on the day of the triumph of the revolution in February of 1979, accidentally locked themselves in instead. Now this moment, it's, it's kind of slapstick, but it also, in my view, grimly foreshadows uh, the use of the Shah's prisons, the, the reabsorption, immediate absorption of the Shah's most hated prisons by the new government to hold more detainees than ever before. And this happens quite quickly. There are about, for instance, at Evin, about between 1,000 and 1,500 prisoners held there in, immediately before the revolution. Within just a few months, there's several thousand people held there. Um, so this idea that, that's being promoted in the pre-revolutionary days that the bureaucracy of the Pahlavi state, the institutions of the Pahlavi state will simply wither away upon the sort of coming to power of the Islamic Republic is, is, is not even really attempted. I end in the contemporary period during which the current government has further intensified its use of carceral tactics, as we've seen, including mass arrests, mass executions, to suppress dissent. Yet in this period, Iran, Iran's government and judiciary has also repeatedly avowed the goal of significantly reducing Iran's prisoner totals. But despite their seeming contradictions, these strategies, I argue, are linked by the logic of carceral expansion, tied together by the use of new technologies such as ankle monitors, facial recognition software, biometric surveillance, or what scholars call prison by another name. So the book starts uh, with telling us why the carceral state is built. And it ends by trying to explain this, this change that's happening in the carceral state, where the government is actively, like many, many governments around the world, um, is actively trying to think about a, a carceral world beyond the prison, right? So now that I've given a basic overview of the structure of the book, let me continue by telling you a little bit more about its key arguments. Now, the first argument is simple. The making of the modern prison system in Iran has led to an enduring and elemental transformation in Iranian life over the course of the past century. As such, the book examines key moments in the establishment of this prison system, the resulting incarceration of millions of Iranians over the course of a century, and, the, and some of the responses uh, among both Iranians and non-Iranians to these new prisons. Now this transformation didn't happen in isolation, I show, but was part of a global trend in promoting, in, in an era of promoting carceral solutions, uh, again, that is surveillance, policing, criminalization, and imprisonment to a host of social issues from drug use to border crossing to sex work to um, forms of political thought that are deemed unfit for any given state. So the idea that uh, surveillance and imprisonment is the way to solve those problems is, is becomes very, very popular in the late 19th and 20th centuries across the world. Now, it's difficult to overstate the changes that the modern carceral system has brought to Iran. For most of Iran's long pre-20th century history, forced confinement was quite rare. And long periods of incarceration, even up to a year, even a year of incarceration was extraordinarily rare. Um, I have a couple of images here of, of, of punishment practices from the late Qajar era. This is already when things are starting to transform, but we see a little bit of what the before looks like in images of uh, public whipping on the soles of the feet of the person being punished, the bastinado, which is, remains something that's in use into the contemporary period, but no longer in public. For, um, and this, here are some prisoners from, again, the late Qajar period. We'll see very soon, just a few decades after this, um, the sort of reforms that are undertaken in the prison system, what people look like when they're incarcerated. But these, these, this form of stocks uh, that we see like around their feet and chains around the necks of these um, detained persons, they stop being used. Now, this is not to say that forced detention didn't exist before the modern era, but that jailing spaces were neither systematized nor capable of holding large numbers of people long term. The prison then in Iran, as in other places, is a fundamentally modern institution. What a very important historian by the name of Frank Dakota in the Chinese context has called a cathedral to modernity, a cathedral of modernity one that has reshaped the fabric of sort of ordinary Iranian life. 
And the central argument of my book hinges on what I call the public life of the prison. I use this phrase in two linked senses. And really, this is the major argument that I'm, I'm making. The first of which is fairly straightforward. It refers to the new public conversations that modern prisons elicit in Iran. So this huge change is happening. All of these new laws go on the books in the 1920s and 30s. Legal centralization criminalizes acts that had very recently not been criminal. So people have to learn en masse how not to get arrested and what to do if they are. The central topics of my book, prisons in Iran, have been of great significance to Iranians themselves. And for those in the room who, who may be Iranian, I, I think you might know what I mean. We all know stories ab about people who have been incarcerated or who have experiences with the carceral state. But as soon as plans for new modern prisons were formulated in the early 20th century, um, the archive shows that Iranians were talking about and writing about those prisons. After carceral centralization and legal centralization in the 1920s and 30s, as I said, Iranians had to learn en masse how not to get arrested and what to do if they were. Like people everywhere, Iranians did this through new genres, such as prison memoirs, the academic uh, field of criminology, newspaper accounts of crime and punishment, and of course, face-to-face -face interactions with new institutions of policing, surveillance, and incarceration all of which form key archives in the book. So again, this is a moment of expansion in the 1920s and 30s. If you look at the numbers of modern, you know, the first poli modern police force that's formed in Iran in the late Qajar period in the late 19th century, it's only in Tehran and it's very few even police officers, right? By the 1920s and 30s, we're talking about many hundreds of police officers. Police officers, every year there's an expansion of the police force such that by the end of the Pahlavi period, we're talking about tens of thousands of, of police officers. We're talking about hundreds of new laws on the books, uh, literally hundreds of new prisons. So this is a very quick transformation in how punishment is, is or in how the concept of justice is meted out. <coughs> so people are talking about prisons, but that's not the only thing that I mean by the public life of the prison. The modern prison system has also proven foundational for Iranian political movements. Throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, Iranians have written on, organized political activism around, and produced art and literature contemplating the relationship between power, citizenship, and incarceration. Some of Iran's most important dissident parties were formed in prisons or published key materials in prison. It was in Ghast prison, which I showed us before, that a small group of intellectuals lay the groundwork for the only mass-based party in the history of modern Iran, the communist Tudeh party. One of the party's founding members, Bozor Galavi, a novelist, later claimed, prison for us was truly a school. We learned many things there, not only about social and political matters, but also, well, what didn't we learn? For example, I learned Russian in prison. I learned English in prison. In prison, one read in earnest. In other words, prison was the space in which Alavi and his comrades fully committed to their political life. Now, the idea of prison as a kind of political and social training ground has remained uh, very lively throughout the next number of decades. Um, incarcerated dissidents have long referred to the notorious Evin prison in the Islamic Republic as Evin University. <clears throat> so the book looks at things from the prison memoirs of 1920s Iranian Communist Party members to the prison communiques of the Islamist Fedayeen Islam Party in the 1950s to the prison art of 1970s guerrillas, to prison writing in today's Islamic Republic. Now, incarcerated dissidents have also endeavored to make the inner workings of pu prisons public knowledge. That's part of the public life of the prison, from hand-drawn maps of Pahlavi era prisons drawn by guerrillas and circulated in guerrilla pamphlets and literature, such as this one of the Comité Interrogation Center uh, in Tehran, which was drawn by a Marxist guerrilla in, and published in Astra Amal pamphlet, <coughs> to digital map, prison mapping projects in today's Islamic Republic. That these movements have called for liberation from the context of imprisonment is, I argue, reflective of the modern prison's public life. Yet, and this is key for me, um, the public life of prison is not simply that which dissidents have said or thought in, re in, in response to their own or to their comrades' incarceration. I argue that carceral practices 
that is linked systems of surveillance, policing, punishment, and incarceration, again, have transformed all Iranian social worlds and public life, not just of those of the most politically engaged. My argument is not merely that the modern carceral state produced new public cultures in Iran, though of course it did, but rather that modern forms of incarceration shaped the very notion of the public. This is the second sense, and I think key sense, in which I theorize the public life of the prison. I argue that in drawing, redrawing, and policing, con consistently policing the line between the bad criminal and the good citizen, carceral techniques of the modern state have broadly shaped notions of citizenship, freedom, nationalized inclusion, and exclusion in Iran. Let me give you a historical example. Labeling its expansion of prison factories social work, for instance, the mid 20th century Pahlavi government argued that expanded prisons were necessary to quote, train and educate deviant Iranians so they could quote, live nobly as productive citizens. The Pahlavi officials also touted the rehabilitative capacity of these new prisons. The names of Iran's prisons were thus changed in the 1960s to reflect this. The central prison for men and women, was changed to penitentiary or place of repentance for men and women, so from Zendon to ne Nedomatga. While some prisons stopped using the word prison or Zendon altogether and instead called themselves places of counsel and Darzga. This project, this idea of a rehabilitation, rehabilitative role and responsibility of prisons as prisons as a kind of space where socially sick persons can be healed, um, has uh, continued, albeit in different ideological dressing, in today's Islamic Republic. Referring to prisons as, quote, virtue training schools, the Islamic Republic has similarly promoted prisons as a space where criminals turn into ethical, modern Islamic citizens. So let me emphasize this point. As the number of incarcerated persons in Iran has increased, Members of first the Pahlavi and later the Islamic Republic governments have routinely promised that modern carceral methods, that incarcerating huge numbers of people, would make Iranian citizens safer by imprisoning and reforming cr criminals into productive members of society. This process has been marked towards what I, following a recent tradition of critical prison studies, call the carceral imagination or a way of seeing the world in which surveillance, policing, criminalization, and incarceration of large numbers, even tens or hundreds of thousands of people, is normalized and viewed as inherent to the project of progress, modernity, and humanity. And this is really a point I can't emphasize enough, that both the pre- and post-revolutionary governments, when you look at their, their own conversations on prisons, both internally and public-facing, Discuss prisons as a way to make the country better, to make it safer, to make it more humane, to make it more modern, to make it more progressive, and, and more recently, to make it more Muslim. <clears throat> so in the book, using a multi-genre and multilingual archive from across three continents and numerous countries, and I'm happy to talk about that archive in the Q&A. I won't go into too much detail about it here. I analyzed the methods by which imprisonment came to be seen in Iran as a necessary response to a host of social issues and a step towards placing the country among progressive and civilized modern states. Now this brings me to the next key argument of the book to which I've already gestured. Now the book obviously is a book about prisons in Iran, but I argue in the book that the history of prisons is foundationally global. We can't understand this big transformation, this, this enormous transformation, without understanding that this is something that's happening all over the world. The architectures, economies, and techniques of modern punishment, as well as people's responses to that punishment, are transnational and linked. Even places today imagined to be politically opposed, such as the Islamic Republic of Iran and the US, two of the most heavily carceral states in the world, and the US laps everyone by many, many orders of magnitude, are quite literally operating from the same blueprints. <clears throat> in the book, I dwell in the previously undiscovered connections between places not typically thought of together, like Mashhad, Iran, on the one hand, and Marion, Illinois, on the other. Several prisons in the contemporary Islamic of Iran, including one in Mashhad, were, print, were built in the 1960s from blueprints 
taken from USP Marion in Illinois, which is now a prison in the US federal supermax system. US Mar USP Marion was built virtually at the same time as these Iranian counterparts, as both penal systems experimented in a time of rising um, unrest uh, and increasing numbers of incarcerated persons with experimenting with confining trouble populations. And the Marian model was exported all over the world. It was exp uh, to US allies at the time. So to, from Marian, Illinois, to Pahlavi, Iran, to Israel, to New Zealand, to several other countries. Um, and those prisons are still in use today in Iran and in the US. Now to situate Iran's carceral history in a global framework, does not mean the erasure of its historical specificity, but rather to better understand that specificity within a broader frame. A brief example might help better situate the di this dialectic between the local and the global. Today in the Islamic Republic, the government, as I mentioned before, has increasingly used new and globally popular technologies such as ankle monitors and biometric surveillance, uh, which is a fact that links Iran's carceral system today to cutting edge surveillance and punishment technologies used by governments and private corporations the world over. Yet in Iran, in order to understand what's happening in Iran, we both have to understand that global frame, the sort of the global networks, who they're buying these things from, how they may be producing these technologies, while also understanding uh, the novel ways that Iran uses these technologies that are particular to its needs as a modern authoritarian Islamic government. In early, 19, uh, in early 2020, at the sort of height of the early COVID um, era, the Tehran Morality Police, the police force responsible for the arrest and death of Gina Amini, the young woman whose death launched an uprising in 2022, began using traffic cameras to not only issue tickets for traffic violations, but also to send text message summonses to women for alleged hijab violations. Those who didn't respond and those who were issued repeat summonses were told that they were in danger of having their cars impounded. This new policy was a portent of the further expansion of this uh, sort of new surveillance tech into the world of morality policing. Now, amid the uprising, law enforcement officials ominously promised an escalation of the use of these new technologies in policing hijab. So when there were those critiquing the morality police for their heavy handed measures, Iran said, okay, well, we'll deal with that through uh, using more technology, which will be less likely to cause cataclysmic violence, but more capable of causing everyday disturbance in people's lives. The government's investment in molding what it views as proper Islamic citizens then is reliant on new carceral technologies that are used to surveil police and punishment behavior the world over. So again, we see this dialectic between the local and the global. We can't imagine or understand what's happening in Iran without understanding that there is something um, sort of constantly shifting in the Iranian, uh, gov in the sort of, in, in the way that the government addresses questions of, of of social dissent or social disorder, um, that it wants to carceralize uh, public space in this way. So that's a contemporary example, but uh, Iran's modern prison system was a global project from the outset, linked directly first to European and then eventually American trends in penology, criminology, and law enforcement, and more recently trends that are fundamentally so global as to not say that they're coming from any one place uh, in particular. So let me delve just a little more into this global context because I think it's a really important uh, part of the book. Now Iran's new prisons emerge in a context of colonial exploitation, territorial loss, and importantly, civilizational anxiety about Iran's status vis-a-vis -vis the colonial powers. This is something that historians have talked about in other contexts, as well as in the Iranian context a great deal, that Iran is not directly colonized by its colonial adversaries, namely Britain and Russia. It's not under direct rule, but it loses territory, it is, it is exploited uh, economically. And this leads to reformists, nationalists, intellectuals to having a great deal of anxiety about their standing vis-a-vis -vis European, uh, the European states. This is true of the new Pahlavi government as well, who was quick to try to reform its carceral system along European lines, which had been uh, starting in the late Qajar period, but which is taken up in, in more, with more energy in the Pahlavi period. In 1925, members of the Iranian police force traveled to the International Penal and Penitentiary Commission Conference in London. 
It was the first time an Iranian delegation participated in an IPC conference, although these conferences had been going on for some decades. And for instance, the neighboring Ottoman Empire had participated in them for like 50 years by this point. Sir Evelyn Ruggles Brees, British president of the IPC, boasted to, to the co conference when it happened that the commission was, quote, a confederation of the most civilized states of the world, working quietly and unostentatiously to introduce a greater humanity to punishment systems around the world. And that's, that whole thing is a quote. The Iranian delegates went home aiming to expand and reform Iran's prison system along the lines promoted by the commission. And in the book, I go into this in great detail, just what they learned, what they are interested in doing, who builds these prisons, uh, and, and, and further. Um, here I'll say that in, in 1927, Reza Shah appointed Minister of Justice Ali Akbar Dovar, a very important uh, figure, to lead and reform uh, the new judiciary. Dovar dissolves the existing judiciary and undertakes an expansive overhaul of the legal code. Now, the book is not about this legal transformation, but it's a key moment because that legal centralization happens hand in hand with uh, the establishment of a modern, expansive modern prison system where dozens of new prisons are planned and eventually built. Now, as I said, uh, Qasr is the most important of these new prisons in the 20th century. This is an early image of Gas prison, which was built on the grounds of a Qajar era castle. And this is an image from the 1930s, uh, which I found in an archive uh, in, in Iran. So you remember the image of Gas that we saw that I took a picture of the museum. This is the prison uh, in its earliest instantiation. The Pahlavi Iran intended Qasr to be crown jewel of its new penal system, proved to the world that it was a civilized modern state. And it constantly talked about this, that we are, the, we are leaving a, a, a dark age, a pre, primordial pre-legal era, and now we're in this civilized, uh, we're, we're joining the progressive modern states, we're reforming our prisons, everything's going to look different, right? So there's not going to be stocks around people's feet and chains around their necks, they're going to have uh, these sort of standardized uniforms, they're going to have a very different sort of orientation towards what is happening uh, with them. In the book I talk about, you know, one of the first visitors to Qash is a, an American diplomat, Jay Reeves Childs, who goes in uh, to Qash and says, yes, this is, this is up to snuff. If an American were held here, it would be okay. Um, and that's that's part of the part of what's happening. Reza Shah wants to prove that this is we don't have to that uh, they, in 1928 there's the what is called the abrogation of capitulations, uh, wherein in the past if you were a European or American national if you were accused of a crime in Iran you would simply be sent back to stand justice that would likely never come in your home country. This was an extremely unpopular law among Iranians because they felt that. Uh, they were being taken advantage of by these wanton uh, European and American officers. With the abrogation of capitulations in 1928, it's the first time that the idea that Europeans might stand trial and have to be incarcerated in Iran. And so Reza Shah has to show the new prisons to these, to these American and European diplomats who have to say, okay, this is okay, this is up to, this is up to global civilization standards. Yet despite these high hopes, Qash, as well as all of these new prisons, quickly become objects of criticism, which I think is a story that's a little more well known, um, that the Pahlavi prisons were, were criticized, uh, and eventually lead to a revolutionary movement that took these prisons as a central site of struggle. Iran's pre-revolutionary prisons would become so important to the anti-Shah movement of the 1979 revolution that that revolution has been referred to as the, quote, revolution against torture. And yet, as I mentioned, throughout the Pahlavi period, Iranian prisons were claimed uh, by Pahlavi statesmen and scholars uh, as progressive reforms to the inhumane and uncivilized punishment systems that existed before Pahlavi rule. Uh, briefly, I'd like to mention that the scholarly academy is key to this story. <clears throat> From its inception, the Iranian academy members of whom were often trained in European universities, was linked in complex ways to the project of modern state modernization. In the post-war era, the language, the post-World War II era, I should say, the language and logic of the social sciences, the sort of modern social sciences, sociology, criminology, are increasingly adopted by the Pahlavi elite in tandem with um, academics who are working directly with the government. 
By the 1950s, there was a newfound interest in prison sciences, El Mezendon, in Iran's modern universities. And in 1950, Iran sent its first representative to the Second International Congress of Criminology, convened by the International Society of Criminology in Paris and host to um, nearly 800 participants. Again, criminologists, um, such as several that I quote in the book, talk about the Pahlavi era as one precisely when Iran is moving towards a greater civilization. But in this era, Iran's national police are also sort of showing just what they, uh, we, we start to see just what is happening at the, at the more elemental level, right? In the, in the 1960s, the national police built a museum of criminology where uh, police cadets are taken to learn about fingerprinting techniques and what they are calling scientific police methods. These modern policing methods, again, drawn from global norms, amounted to a vaster surveillance state for all Iranians. So by the mid-1960s, Iran's National Police Bureau of Identification held a repository, and this is a quote, a direct quote from them, with over five million photographs and fingerprints classified according to the Henry system on file. And yet, so we see this kind of push and pull, right? The government and the state, the prison system, the people in charge of the prison system, the national police force are saying these are new humane institutions and they're going to solve the problem of crime. In fact, they, in the mid-century, in the mid to late century, are promising that prisons will make prisons obsolete. In other words, criminals will go into prisons and they will so be transformed uh, in these education systems and so forth that they'll come out and no longer be antisocial, they'll be good people. Uh, and so eventually there'll be no need for the prisons at all. But what we're seeing is actually the building of a massive surveillance apparatus, millions of fingerprints and images on file. Uh, so the, the prison is promoted as this procure, uh, healer of individual pathologies, but is in fact sort of, um, as I say, surveilling uh, people across the board. At a very high level, this is what people are saying. So at the same time that there are already enormously important movements talking about Pahlavi torture, talking about Pahlavi prisons as that which necessitates a revolutionary movement in 1968. You have the Queen saying that most prisoners are capable, and this is in a speech to the prisons organization uh, and many, many police officers and prison wardens and so forth. Many prisoners are capable of reform and cultivation, that we need to treat them humanely, that we need to put them into schools, that we need to put them into factories. The way that they, the, the law enforcement and the high level members of the state are promising this is through labor, so the building of prison factories. This is a fairly early image of Gas prison factory. It really expands quite dramatically in the 60s and 70s into an expansive situation. They also build in the 1960s and 70s several new prisons, again, based on US architectures that are what they're calling labor camps or reform camps uh, that put people to work both outside and inside. Um, they're, they're, these are gendered spaces. Obviously, women are taught things like sewing and embroidery. Men are uh, often uh, working with much more heavy machinery. And we see from the, the discourses of the government, um, just you see in this image just what it is that they're promoting, that you go into prison, a hunched over uh, prisoner, you're a bad guy, and then when you come out, you're following the light of enlightenment, you're coming out a new person, you've got a great head of hair, things are looking Things are looking up for you. So this is from the, the uh, official uh, uh, government-run uh, organization called the Institution for the Cooperation and Industry of Prisoners. Yeah, and by the mid-1960s, there's about 1,000 people in prison factories working uh, day in, day out uh, uh, in prison work programs across the country. Nor would this language of reform cease at the revolution. So the language of criminology and the humanist pretent pretense of reforming detainees through labor would, after a period of upheaval, what I call the carceral utopianism of the early revolutionary moment, where the idea that just throwing a bunch of people in prison or executing a bunch of prison is going to lead to a, a sort of utopian society. After a period of upheaval, these technocratic languages make a return in the mid to late 80s. In 1986, the Islamic Republic founds the Organization of Prisons and National Security Measures to routinize the country's prisons under the aegis of the judiciary. And in the early 90s, the organization establishes new uh, academic centers tasked with conducting prison-related research, with training prison personnel, and, and so forth. 
This center promoted its work as an effort to cure offenders of their, quote, social diseases, again, using exactly the same language that we see in the pre-revolutionary period, through the, quote, most up-to-date knowledge of jail sciences. This effort, which so closely mirrors the criminological language of the pre-revolutionary years, was several decades in the making, as we see. So <clears throat> I'd like to just end with one sort of last argument from, from, the, from the book. Um, and to, to get there, I want to explain a little bit about how the book came to be in the first place. When I started research for this book, I thought that it would be a book about political incarceration, about political dissidents being imprisoned and tortured, because it's such an important story uh, to your, your Iron political life. As I did research, I started to see this, this broader edifice of, a, of, a, of an incredibly important institution that, that is actually being engaged with by many, many more people than simply dissidents, right? And in fact, the overwhelming number of people who have been incarcerated in Iran are not dissidents, right? They're drug users, uh, people on drug-related crimes. So this book is an effort to sort of think analytically about these two categories of prisoners that have been kept institutionally separate and also conceptually separate in our minds, what are called ordinary prisoners, zendonia adi, or common law prisoners on the one hand, and those whom we understand as political prisoners on the other hand, but whom the government, of course, never calls political prisoners either before or after the revolution, but calls security prisoners, security threats, national security threats. That, that's the language that's used. <coughs> So it's, at first I said, okay, I'm gonna, I wanna talk about both of these populations. And then I realized that there's more than just talking about them. It's more than just thinking about how I can get them all in the same book. But rather a realization and an understanding that in fact, conceptually, analytically, the process that renders these two taxonomies legible to us as on the one hand political and on the other hand non-political incarceration, has itself been a political process, has itself been a historical process, and is not a natural division, right? Yes, it's a division from the prisons themselves. They hold these prisoners typically in different, different ways. Um, <clears throat> it is not simply because large numbers of prisoners are held on ostensibly non-political charges, as I say, drug offenses, sex work, sexual deviance, vagrancy, theft, brigandage, border crossing, etc. I argue that we must work to denaturalize what has become an entrenched logic through which we conceptually and thus politically separate these two populations into, into sort of analytically completely, you know, hermetically sealed worlds. <clears throat> this hermetic sealing off of these two categories is a logic that tacitly, if not explicitly, imagines common law prisoners as real criminals uh, sort of natural criminals, people who deserve what they're getting. And it also imagines political imprisonment as a problem only over there in places like illiberal and authoritarian places like Iran. We know that these are problematic assumptions, right? That we have to think through these assumptions in a new way. I argue that in, that in Iran, people detained in Iran as elsewhere in the world, all of the, that incarceration, modern incarceration, stems from self-evidently political issues. The government's attempting to address social and political crises through uh, carceral means. <clears throat> In other words, the historical processes through which all modern states, including Iran, have naturalized the notion from that social issues that they see as problems from drug use to sex work to certain but not all forms of violence, to gendered dress, to certain racialized forms of belonging, uh, demand state intervention, demand carceral in intervention, as opposed to investment, let's say, in mental and public health, or education, community building, stronger social safety nets, various forms of accountability or reparative justice. These are all a product of profoundly political processes, and relatively recent ones at that. And I'm ending here, but let me just give one brief example to sort of illustrate the stakes of that last intervention. Um, in the 1980s, the nascent Islamic Republic of Iran and Ronald Reagan's United States, again, places imagined to be quite different, and, and correctly so, imagined to be t 
um, and un understood to be politically different. Uh, both inaugurated policies that drove exponential increases in their respective rates of incarceration. In both countries, the overwhelming number of new detainees were largely arrested on drug charges. As each country undertook its own war on drugs, and both used that language, again, under radically different politically, political circumstances, the US as part of a racist, tough on crime uh, push, and the Islamic Republic as part of Khomeini's promise to purify Iran of Western influence and counter-revolutionary decadence, increasing numbers of socially vulnerable people were ensnared in each state's dragnet. Yet despite the political nature of policy decisions like this, we do not conventionally think of drug-related detainees as political prisoners, as in either the Islamic Republic or the US, nor do we typically ask why similar expansions of the carceral state targeting drug users were enacted in several places, Iran, the US, Brazil, and several others simultaneously in the 1980s. What made it so that all these governments just woke up and decided, yeah, we're gonna put everyone that we think has ever touched any sort of illicit substance into prison. To the contrary, conventional categories push us to see incarceration in places around the world as fundamentally different from each other, with only places like Iran marked by the scourge of torture and political imprisonment, despite copious evidence to the contrary. I think that the stakes of this argument are rendered all the clearer, even for those of us who care specifically about prisoners in Iran and the politics of the contemporary Iran, when we understand that the Islamic Republic routinely justifies its actions against not only common law prisoners, but also political dissidents, incarcerated dissidents, by routinely referring to them either as mere criminals or as terrorists, and thus worthy of punishment, right? That our categories, we call them political prisoners, but from the point of view of the government, this is all part of uh, a world of criminality that it needs to stamp out. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you all very much. That sort of wraps up all of the arguments in the book, but I'm happy to answer questions about archives, about anything else. Yeah, thank you. No, no, yeah. Um, no, you know, really one of the arguments I make in the book and, is that both before and after the revolution, and this is not, again, this is not only an Iranian phenomenon, the language that criminologists and social scientists are using in the 20th century, less so in the 21st because it hasn't worked, but the language that's popularized in, in modern criminology is the idea that reform, that the prison is in fact the reform. It will reform, whereas in the past, and the, the whole quote, which I don't have up here, um, Farah says something like, we use our prisons as punishment, not for punishment. In prisons of old, so much did they torture and torment that people would come out broke. I mean, this is, there's a kind of, dissonance in her saying this at the same time that we know what, it, what else is happening in these prisons. But she's saying, you know, we, if we educate, if we cultivate, if we, and the word she uses is tarbiyat, so it has the meaning of discipline, of education, of, of you know, there's all of these different sort of shades of meaning. <clears throat> she's not the only one saying this. The chief of police, Mohsen Mubassar, I, I dwell on him for a long time. He's really obsessed with this idea. But they're drawing it from criminologists. They're working directly with academics. They're not just saying this themselves. They're saying, look, we brought this chief academic from the University of Tehran who's talk who went to this conference in Paris where they said that if we did X, Y, and Z, there would be less criminality. And again, this is the penitentiary model of the prison that is popularized all across the world in the 19th and 20th centuries. So the idea of the penitentiary, a place of penitence, you feel bad for what you've done and you learn from what you've done and you come out a changed person. Yeah, that didn't work. It hasn't worked. Um, all that has happened in any of these heavily carceral states is expansion. So if I don't have it up here, but if, if, I, if, if I did, if you look at the 
the number of incarcerated persons, and if you add everyone together, political dissidents and ordinary prisoners alike, from the 1910s when the first prison network is built, the first modern prison network is built, to today you just see an exponential line. It just goes up and up and up. As soon as you say that there are certain activities for, peop for, for which people need to be sequestered, it's very hard to undo that. It's very hard to, to say, OK, yeah, I mean, there are individual instances. Obviously, you can find, and the archive shows that there are individual instances where someone worked in the prison factory and then says, yeah, that really changed my life. That happens in the US as well, people who, but actually, the most recent scholarship in prison studies over the course of the last several decades is um, that prisons are actually breeding grounds for recidivism. They're not breeding grounds for transformation. They're breeding grounds for people being utterly captured in networks of, of sort of wrongdoing. So yeah, the, the, the criminological scholarship has changed, but governments have been much slower to change um, than the academy. At an earlier point, the academy really believed this stuff too. When Farah is saying it, the criminologists are saying it too. Mm -hmm, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm still a big fan. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to pick on the last thread about the separation of mm -hmm. the political and the, uh, what was the term you used, like the ordinary prisoner, yeah. the Commonwealth prisoner. Is how did that um, factor into the revolutionary movement's discussion about um, the prison as mm -hmm. um, school? Because were they including yeah. the Commonwealth prisoner in their um, revolutionary materials? And today, in the movements against our the movements, including the common criminal as well, because you see so much of that double speak where it's like, well, there are criminals in Iran and crime is going up and mm -hmm. things are so, and so you see a lot of justification for those same surveillance technologies and those same mm -hmm. imprisonments at the same time that people are making exceptions for them. To pull yeah, of course. Yeah. So that's a great question. And it's one that is genuinely, I could probably write a whole separate book, mm -hmm. try to excuse me, try to parse all of the different attitudes about this division, which again is a real division in the sense that once you institutionalize a division and you actually legalize that division and you say we're going to hold security prisoners in one prison and we're going to hold ordinary prisoners in another space, yeah, that actually institutionalizes the division in a way that's very hard to just say conceptually we should, re we should put people back together. But um, movements have always had a kind of vexed feeling so it depends. There's, from the late 19th century, actually, we see that from the late Qajar period through the Pahlavi, through the Islamic Republic period, the sending of political dissidents into general holding or into small regional prisons that don't have very many politicals um, as punishment. And it's something that even today, it happens to important political dissidents who are incarcerated today, and they often try not to have these, th not to be sent into those facilities, typically because regional facilities are just much poorer. So day-to-day -day quotidian life is harder. Like throughout the Pahlavi period, there were many, many regional prisons that didn't have running water, that didn't have, so you know, you send a political prisoner out of gas or into those prisons, it's an uncomfortable situation. Um, this, all, this often backfired on the government where there would be political organizing that happened if, among these sort of ordinary, and there's all sorts of, in the archive, there's all, these, all this evidence of when uh, political dissidents would be held and in, thrown into general holding with ordinary, uh, ordinary incarcerated peoples that they would, you know, like read newspapers out loud to them, because especially in the earlier periods, there would be high rates of illiteracy. They would form different types of political solidarities. So when people are together, there is a kind of social network that starts to form. So keeping them separate actually is, is key in some ways to the government's approach to not allowing these solidarities to form. But then there are also different kinds of frustration on, or the part of the reason I make this argument is I think that it's actually at a political level, at a moral level, there's all of these opportunities for, for solidarity that haven't been picked up. Because in part, because global uh, human rights organizations have since the 60s and 70s used the language of prisoners of conscience, um, that's the Amnesty International language. They invented this language of prisoners of conscience, which is, in their view, the most sort of heinous type of prisoner, people who are merely being held for having convictions that differ from the government. Their definition was so strict that even Nelson Mandela didn't count. Uh, this was very, very controversial at the time because he took up arms. So the idea that if you're taking up arms, you're no longer a prisoner of conscience, you're actually breaking laws, <coughs> even if what you're doing is just. So th there's also a 
a kind of, in my view, bureaucratic taxonomy that human rights organizations have produced that has replicated itself in movement. I'll give one last example. I know we're running out of time. But in the early 2000s, the very first people to ring the alarm on Kahrizak prison, which became a, you know, something that we all knew, a, a household name among those who pay attention to Iranian politics, with the 2009 Green Movement, Green Movement and throwing of dissidents into Kahrizak and the death of some political um, dissidents in Kahrizak. Ordinary prisoners in Tehran were the ones who were first held there. Now, it's a, it was largely under uh, underground facility, extremely dire s circumstances, clearly breaking every, like violating every norm of human rights, um, and prisoner family movements of these, basically some of the poorest strata of people in Iran. They were rounded up. There were these basically vice raids on poor communities in Tehran. And folks were rounded up and thrown into these prisons. And there are small networks, typically, again, of families, family members, were trying to sound the alarm. But we also have to understand that typically these are much poorer people, don't have access to English language um, journalism, don't have the same kinds of, you know, they're in some ways um, just you know, thinking about privilege among prisoners is weird, but we have to understand that these, these types of divisions do persevere. They were sounding the alarm, but it wasn't really being sounded at an international level about this particular facility. The facility comes up again in 2009 when there are these mass arrests of protesters, and a lot of the same practices are used one to the other. So my argument is about thinking about the ways in which these are all political processes is actually help, might help us link, see a bigger picture to how the government operates, to how it sees a problem population and then tries to address that problem po population. And that our own sort of discomfort with like, well, that person might have done something that I consider morally, it's not about the morality of what people do. We can actually have different differences of opinion. But it's, in my view, ultimately about the morality of throwing you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people into, into these facilities and throwing away the key. We can still have a kind of analysis of, of the problems with that, even as we try to parse what some of our differences may be and how to address those social issues. Right? We don't have to consent on that first. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. All right. I think, uh, I think we're out of time. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm always a little too talkative.